So much on my mind Keep it all in line Juggling tasks that fall from the sky Oh, what a scene Somewhere on this road There is a load that's lighter for me Show me the road that's lighter for me Welcome to episode 14 of Chaos to Calm. I'm your host, Noelle Kirshner. I'm a minister and mother of three. I've written for places like The Huffington Post, The Today Show Parenting Team, and Crosswalk.com. I've also recently published a book on life purpose. In this series, I like to explore how faith can help us move from chaos to calm. Developing character in our children can help us do just that. My guest today has written a children's book series on character. I am delighted to welcome New York Times bestselling author, actress, and producer, Candace Cameron Bure. Candace, it is such a delight to have you here today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy filming schedule to be with us. You're so welcome. I'm happy to be here. So we have at least three favorite things in common, faith, family, and Hallmark. I (laughs) love everything that you've done on Hallmark. I'm such a big fan. So I wanted to start um, with the question, what is your favorite Hallmark film that you've been in and why? Oh, a uh, great question. Hard one to answer because I feel like all my Hallmark movies are like my children. Like you love them all equally and as much, but for different reasons. And there's special things about them. each one, you know, special for a different reason than another. But, you know, one of my standout movies, which isn't, isn't as popular, I guess, is one called Just the Way You Are. And I loved this movie because it, it I kind of, I created this, the story, which was very, very loosely based on my own life. And it was about a couple that had been married for 15 years, but they just had lost their connection and work and life had gotten in the way. So they decided to redate each other. And it's such a cute movie. And by the end, they renew their vows and it's, it's really a sweet movie, but I always loved that one. It just, it had a deeper meaning than some of the other Hallmark movies that I've done. But I of course always love the Christmas movies because they're like so fun. And, uh, I loved, I loved journey back to Christmas because that was set in the 1940s. So it was really fun to do a period piece. And that's the only Hallmark movie I've done that's been period for part of it. And the other one was switched for Christmas because I played twins and my daughter, Natasha, was in that movie. Oh, my goodness. I didn't know that she was. Where was she? She oh, she, she actually daughter. played as I was one of the twins, had two kids. So she was the daughter. So she, I, she played my daughter in it. <laughs> I never made that connection, but now I see yeah. it. Wow, yeah. that's neat. Well, my favorite Christmas one was A Shoe Addict's Christmas. Not only because your name was my name and spelled like my name, which is very rare, uh-huh. uh, but I loved all of the different shoes that you put on and that Cinderella moment that transported you. I feel like every woman can um, appreciate that. And I thought that the message was also really great. Taking risk in life and in love, it really meant something to me. I liked that film quite a bit. I heard that some of those shoes were your own shoes. Is that (laughs) right? A lot of them were my shoes. I am a shoe addict. That's why I knew that it was based on a book and I knew this, we were going to make this one into a movie because I, you know, shoes are just my thing. Some women like jewelry, purses, whatever. I love shoes. But yeah, I brought a couple of very large suitcases up just filled with shoes because I wanted everything to be great. And and even in the department store, because you would just see a lot of shoes in the background, I put all my own shoes in there to make sure they were great shoes and not just ones that had been sitting in a warehouse that were old and, you know, in a prop house. So, right. So even that shoe display from the movie, that was a lot of, a, a lot of them were mine. Yeah. Wow. That's neat. 
Well, you've done so much on Hallmark and in so many other venues as well. But as a pastor, I was particularly impacted by your Hope Rising concert. I felt like you brought so many other Christian, you know, diverse voices together for mm-hmm. a common good and a common purpose. And it brought hope during COVID-19, which I think is, is so desperately needed, but it also brought a sense of unity. And I'm wondering, as a Christian, you know, in this still difficult time, what advice do you have for people who want to serve as a kind of healing bomb as well? Yes. Well, thank you. That, that Hope Rising concert really was incredible and put together so quickly, but it's, it's one of those times where you're so grateful for humanity when, they, when everyone comes together to work for the, the greater good. And that was one of those moments. And I was so happy to be a part of it. And all the speakers and and musicians that were a part of it were so gracious to lend their talent. And, um, but you know, uh, your, your question, can you actually repeat the question? Sure. I, I want to know what your advice would be for people who want to serve as a kind of healing bomb as well. It may not be on a national stage. Sure. I think you tapped into something that was really rich and frankly needed in the church as well as in the world through that event? Well, we all have a platform. It just doesn't have to be on a national level, but we all have a platform. You have a platform in your home. You have it on social media. You have it when you go out to the grocery store because what you, what you put out as far as your, your energy and your words, those matter and you carry that wherever you go. So as a Christian, I know particularly when, when you do use that label, I'm a Christian, people look even closer. They look even harder because there are many people that want to find the hypocrisy. And yet there are so many people that also just know what that means and look to you to represent it well. And so we can all, we can all do that, but remember that, you know, your words and your choices to your children, to your husband, your wife, the barista at the coffee shop, they all matter. And we're not perfect people. We're human and we all can, you know, we'll have bad days, but, but it's something that I remember. I mean, every morning when I wake up, it's like not only putting on the armor of God, but putting on the Holy Spirit, putting on the fruit of the Spirit to make sure that I'm the best representative and ambassador for God that I can be. And I think that's helpful for to you listening is just to remind yourself of that every day. Like I might be the only Christian someone talks to today. So how am I going to use that platform and represent him? I love that. Thinking about how we all have a platform. It's so appropriate in the social media age, but it stretches far beyond that. That's what I hear you saying in just informal interactions in our daily life and uh, the kindness effect. I know you even have a day spring line, don't you? About love overall, putting on love every day and walking around like, you know, you are loved and you can love others. It's powerful. Exactly. It really is. And uh, yeah, I have all, all of those faith inspired products, but we, I mean, it all comes from scripture Mm -hmm. and I do love the theme of the love overall uh, products, which comes from Colossians. It's like, we have all of these virtues, patience and humility and kindness, but we have to put on love because this is what binds all of those in unity. And it's the greatest gift that we can, we can give one another. Mm -hmm. And during Hope Rising, it felt like everybody came together for the common love of one another. And I just remember sitting there and watching it and thinking, this is church. This is Mm -hmm. church at its best. We're all coming together. We're not competing against the church down the street. We're not judging. We are just glorifying and enjoying love. And it was really, it was very special. So thank you for doing that. I'm so glad to hear that. 
Yeah. So we're here today to talk about your newest children's book. I'm so excited for you. Candace's playful puppy. Do you have a picture? Yes. I'm, I'm getting it right now. There awesome. we go. Yay. It was so just cute. released yesterday. I see that it's already a number mm-hmm. one new release on Amazon. Congratulations. Woohoo! Thanks. Yes. I haven't even checked anything. Oh, it's, <laughs> that's so great. It's so great. And you know, I have to say, we're going to get into the details of the book, but I feel like a puppy book is so timely during quarantine. I feel like everyone I know has gotten a quarantine puppy. So it couldn't be a more timely topic to talk about. Uh, Right. I know. Who knew that when I wrote this well over a year and a half ago, we'd be at this place in our lives. But um, this is the third of the third book in the series of Candace children's books. And Candace's playful puppy takes you through a story that Candace adopts a, a puppy from the shelter. And she has a big responsibility, but she has to learn about faithfulness. And so every one of my books, and particularly the children's books, just like an episode of Full House, there's always a little lesson to be learned. And I, I love that. And I, I'm intentional about writing that because I always want there to be conversations that a parent can have with their child or the babysitter or grandma and grandpa after you read a book and you talk about these principles and and the lesson that we've learned. So Candace needs to learn to be faithful in taking care of her dog, feeding him, washing him, walking him, bathing him. And of course, she gets a little frustrated when he doesn't listen to her and he even runs away. But we know that with faithfulness, there's always a good positive results at the end of that. That's right. And she does learn a lot. And we follow that story along with her. Why is faithfulness such a key virtue? Why did you want to plug that and emphasize it in your book? Well, each book, I mean, I know the themes of, of the, the, the first nine books, I should say, because they're all the fruit of the spirit, which is in Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So basically, I want to write a book on each of these. And the, the previous book, Grow Candace Grow, was all about patience. And then I was, I was thinking of... Um, faithfulness like what what was a way what is a way i could share this story from a little kid's point of view that would be fun and i immediately thought about my own dog boris who is awesome and he's a big huge rottweiler but you really have to be faithful with that responsibility especially when you're a kid i know a lot of parents are always hesitant to get a pet because we know as parents, we're going to end up doing it. We're going to have to take over the responsibility. So I thought this is perfect. It's not just about responsibility, but really being faithful to the end, to hanging in there each and every day, even on the days you don't want to, because God looks at our faithfulness. He's entrusting us with so many things. And when we are faithful, we're always rewarded with our faithfulness. So I just thought it was the perfect combination of a story to share uh, with a puppy and faithfulness seemed to be like the word that went with it best. Absolutely. So I have to say any parent who's thinking about bringing home a pet of any type needs to buy this book. (laughs) It really does emphasize that the child takes a lot of responsibility, as you're saying. It's not the parent who's kind of orchestrating it all. You go through the ups and downs with her of learning this important spiritual virtue. And I like that the Candace series does focus on a fruit of the spirit, focus on a worthy spiritual quality, because I think so often, you know, as parents, we think it's important to impart the skills to get straight A's or to succeed in sports or to succeed in performance or some other venue. But statistics say that it is character that is the number one determining factor for children's future success. And these books are character builders. So was Boris hard to train? Was he (laughs) why you came up with uh, a dog theme? Well, it's funny. I'm a huge dog lover. I've never been without a dog in our home since I was 17 years old. So, um, but Boris is actually a really great listener 
when he wants to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen some of the Instagram videos yeah. on that, Candace. <laughs> yeah. the, the problem with Boris is that, well, Val, my husband, is the alpha, meaning that whatever Val says and does, Boris is very a very good listener and attentive, but he knows I'm a, I'm a pushover, so he takes advantage of it. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. And he's, Boris is bigger than I am. I mean, he weighs more than I do. And he's, he's a Rottweiler. He's all muscle. He's so strong. So if I try to tell him otherwise, and he's just not in the mood, I mean, I physically can't do anything about it because <laughs> I can't make him budge if he doesn't want to. Wow. Well, I noticed in the dedication to your newest book, you mentioned a lot. It looked like of furry friends. You had a lot of furry friends listed in there. Were those all your dogs growing up? Oh my goodness. I have to go back to my dedication. Oh yeah. Yes. Those were all my dogs growing up. I listed all of them. And then of course the two dogs from full house and fuller house Cosmo and Comet. Oh my goodness. So you are definitely a dog lover. So how did Harry, the hamster, who is in all of your books on every page, how did he make it into your story? What, what was the reason for him? He's oh, so well, this is so brilliant. And I'm so thankful to my publisher <laughs> and editor uh, Zondervan that helped me because it's very different to write trade books or chapter books compared to a ch children's book. It's, it's, such a different process. And although children's books are very simple or can be, you have to be so precise with your words because they are, there are so few, and then they have to also coordinate with all the illustrations. So it's, it's quite a challenge and something that was very new for me. So when we were originally thinking of these books and what I wanted to do and the stories that I told, it was, it was a suggestion from my publisher. And I actually had lots of hamsters growing up. We had several hamsters growing up. And we thought, oh, she, it would be fun to have a little buddy and a sidekick for her. And it turned into Harry the hamster. And then our illustrator, Christine Batus, who's done such a wonderful job. I absolutely love how she's illustrated these books. But she was the one that started drawing Harry like, in her, in Candace's hair, in her bun, always peeking out of her backpack. And so as we continued to talk through the process, I had said, I want Harry on every page. I want it to be like, where's Waldo? So kids yes. can always find some, go find Harry on each and every page. So now we've continued that through every book. And I think it's a, that little extra special thing that's inside. So your three books in the series to date, um, one is on performance. One is on gardening. I've seen your Instagram. I know you love to garden. Um, one is on dogs. You obviously are an animal lover. What do you have a sneak peek into the fourth? Is it going to be on something else that you love? I, I know it will be because I always write from the heart and something that is relatable to me in my life, whether it's me or from one of my kids or my husband. But I, I know I will continue with the fruit of the spirit. So there will, there will be a virtue in it, but I haven't decided which one will be next because I'm actually starting to write a different book before the next children's book. So my mind is focused on this other book and then I'll have a little while to think of what story I want to tell next for the kids to ruminate. Well, something else that I appreciate about Candace, as I've read your three stories to date, is that she is very eager to say a little prayer. If she needs that mm -hmm. extra dose of support, she's not shy about it. And I can just see faith weaving through so much of what you write, what you speak about, what you organize, like the Hope Rising mm -hmm. concert. So I'm wondering as a fan of yours, and I'd love for my listeners to hear as well, what, what began this faith story for you? How, how did it begin and why is it so important to you today to share? Well, it's a great question and one that can have a very long answer, <laughs> but you know, one of the, the best answers I can give you is, is that I've shared my testimony many times and you can go to my website and read a brief synopsis of it. You can actually Google my name because I've spoken, I, for 10 years, I spoke at women's ministry conferences 
So my testimony's out there if anyone wants to listen to it in full. But, you know, in short, I, I, my family started going to church when I was 12 years old. That was the first time. So I was not born and raised into a Christian household. But, um, but I gave my life to Christ at 12. And over the years, you know, it was, it was always a part of my life, but it wasn't something we necessarily practiced at home. It's not like we sat down as a family together and read the Bible or anything like that. It was, it was um, every person in my family. I have two sisters and one brother and then my mom and dad. My mom was always the faith driven person in my home, but my dad was never a man of faith until about maybe 10 years ago maybe a little longer than that. But um, so it's just been an interesting journey to watch every member of our family because we are all Christians to, to this day. And our, our faith is incredibly important to all of us. But my journey didn't really start until my early 20s. Although I would consider myself a Christian at 12, it, I didn't understand the not only the importance, but I really truly never understood the gospel message at its core. I never understood why I really needed Jesus because I thought I was a good person. So to say that I needed Jesus because he died for my sin, I would have told you, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not a sinner. I mean, I'm a really good person. And it wasn't until I finally understood what the gospel message meant in my early twenties that I am a sinner. If I, if I compare my life in the standard of what God calls perfection up to the 10 commandments, well, I don't hold any of those. So if I can't keep the 10 commandments, then I am a sinner. And it, that was what struck me, I realized that God's standard was very different than the world standard as far as s saying who is a good person. Mm -hmm. And so that was when the, I like to say the it was like the veil was taken off of my face. And I went, oh, I get it. I get that I'm not this perfect, wonderful person. I am a sinner before God. And then understood my need for Jesus, then understood that Jesus died for that for that reconciliation so that I could be justified by God, that I don't have to be perfect, that I can not ever live up to the standard that God holds. And that's why Jesus died for all of us. Obviously, you know this, I'm just sharing the gospel, but that was really it in its core. I had to understand what that meant. And then everything in my life changed because I saw myself for who I really am and that it's a sinner before God in need of his grace. And from that day forward, I was like, God, I don't ever want this, this fire to go out from under me. I realized that my purpose in life is to glorify you and, uh, and all that I do in, in personal life, in motherhood, in marriage, in my work and professional life, I want to glorify you and help me keep my eyes focused and set on that. And I've been doing my best every day since to try to do that. It's so touching to hear you share your heart in this way and, you know, reflect a sense of mercy and humility when you are such an amazing, you've accomplished so much, but I understand that mercy, you know, I understand that need for grace. We all um, are welcome, right, into the loving arms of God. And it's a peaceful place. And it's a place that can be a beautiful springboard, um, not just for our own heart, but to touch others. Mm -hmm. And so I love how you describe that. And you kind of teased um, out one of my other questions in your answer about how do you keep God as your North star as you're sifting through all of these various things that you have your hands in, you know, you're a best-selling author, you're an actress, you're a producer, but I also have a sense as someone who's followed you from afar that you really do seek to keep God as your North star. And that is something that I think Every person, no matter what walk of life and, and what their purpose is, you know, as a Christian really seeks to do, is there something that has helped you 
helped you be able to hold on to that passion and that sense of clarity all these years later? Yes, prayer has been a huge part of that. And being in the word daily, I, 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 I'm trying to choose my words wisely because of course God welcomes everyone and, and God wants that relationship with each and every one of us. And it's so easy to then be in the relationship and call ourselves a Christian, but then not read the word of God or not spend time with him or not spend time in prayer with him. And that that's a big problem. If you call yourself a Christian, because I know how fast I can get sidetracked, how fast I can allow my mind to think from a worldly perspective instead of a biblical perspective. So keeping myself grounded in the word of God, continually going back to God's truth is what helps me keep him as the North star. And then know, knowing that my, the intention of my decisions is coming from a place of honoring him and glorifying him. And again, let me reiterate it. We're all human beings. I don't do that every day of my life. I make mistakes. I mess up, but the intention is not jumping into that. I'm not intentionally diving away from God, but in my humanness, sometimes things get the best of me, but I have to be grounded in his word. I've got to read the Bible. Otherwise, I, I won't know his truth and I won't be reminded. And um, and that, that part is so incredibly important. And the other thing, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, but what I also believe has helped me, especially with within work, is that I, I know who I am and whose I am, meaning I am a child of God. And I know that first and foremost, and it's so important to know who you are and not, because if you don't, the world will tell you who you're going to be. Mm -hmm. The world will tell you who you should be and define you. So it's been so important to, to know who I am and also set up my guidelines, my boundaries, my priorities, all of those things so that when push comes to shove, I can always go back to the basics and say, okay, what were my priorities in this? What are the boundaries that I have in place? Are any of these pushing outside of them? Um, That has been like the rock foundation for me in my career that my husband and I talked through 15 years ago. And it, it, so when, when I hit those, it's like having little bumper guardrails, like, you know, when you're bowling and the kids, you put those, those bumpers up so the ball can hit the rail, but still hit a few pins by the time it gets to the end. And that's what I feel like those boundaries have been for me. So anytime I start maybe going to, to the side unintentionally, I know how to get back into the center of the lane. And it also helps because I have a husband and family surrounded that are like-minded and helping with those priorities. Well, I love that. I think that art of juggling by keeping that center focus is something that we all can emulate. And I'm so grateful for all that you do and have offered us today by way of getting to know you better, Candace. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. You're so welcome. Thanks for allowing me to talk. (laughs) And thanks to everyone who's watching and listening. Thank you. I am grateful to Candace for her work, but also for sharing her heart with us today. I hope you will check out the entire Candace series. Until next time, may calm be with you.